Okay, right. So, so this is a case study really of, of the outstanding work done by uh, Erica and Kurt and uh, Maria Stefan, which I think is, is absolutely game changer in the world of uh, thinking about security and uh, what causes and what uh, can bring about change, uh, social and political change. And uh, almost everything that they say is borne out certainly in the South African example. Um, and I'm just going to make, there are a few little paradoxes at the edges, but by and large, uh, South Africa is a good example of precisely what they're talking about. Um, my story is going to start um, in a little country called Swaziland, which some of you may know, which is this place down here. Little place there, sort of, it's, 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 it's landlocked and it's smudged between Mozambique and South Africa. And if we go back, the story starts, my story starts in 1984, at that point, uh, there was growing um, ferment inside South Africa. Uh, the, the ANC military wing, to the extent that they were succeeding at all, which was not very much, were sending people from camps in Angola, flying them across to Mozambique, and then they were then infiltrating back into South Africa, not directly across the border, because there was this useful fiction that both Mozambique and South Africa promoted that they didn't have a military presence in Mozambique, which they did. But so they sent it through Swaziland in order to make it seem as if they sort of materialized miraculously in this little place called Swaziland and made it across the border. Anyway, I was told by a man called Chris Heine, who at the time was, I think, the chief of staff of Mkwendo Wisiswi, that I had to present myself in Swaziland at a particular moment, at a particular street corner, and I would be picked up and given new, new things to do. And I, what duly happened, and the man who picked me up was this man here. It's a man called Ronnie Casrells. And Ronnie Casals at the time was head of ANC military intelligence. And he and another chap, his kind of security, took me uh, for a weekend to a little hut, something like this one, not quite as ramshackle as this, but a little hut on a hillside outside the second city called Manzini. And we spent a weekend there um, talking about what my situation was at the time. I was working in the ANC underground inside South Africa. And uh, I'd come across the border, and I was given a debrief, and then I was given... Uh, various tasks that I had to perform. Now, given that he was military intelligence, you know, he was a big boss as far as I was concerned. He was the, the big I am. And I was this young, keen man, keen to please and all the rest of it, as one tends to be at that age. Um, and at the end of it all, as we got to the end of the weekend, uh, Ronnie decided that he was going to give me a pep talk. And he was going to give me a pep talk the like of which I'd never had before. And there was a lot of effing and blinding and bad language and whatever about what we were going to do to the South African regime, etc., and how fearless we all were and how I was going to be marching down Pretoria Street, which is the main street in, at least um, Church Street in Pretoria, which is the capital, down the main street on the victory parade in military fatigues. It was all very impressive and whatever. And the sun was going down. Now, those of you who have been to Africa will know that there are sunsets in Africa which are just perhaps second to none. They are just absolutely spectacular. The dust, ri the dust seems to rise as the sun goes down, and you get fantastic reds. Ronnie was shaking. He needed a drink. He was reaching his climax in his uh, lecture to me, and then all of a sudden, something big and black came through the window. It was a bat, and we both fled out of... <laughs> out of the hat, <laughs> screaming, I kid you not, the a head of ANC military intelligence and me screaming. <laughs> and this other chap who was in an adjoining hut of the security came running across saying, what, what's, you know, what's, what's going on? And we said, there's a bat in there, there's a bat in there. So he said, well, what's the matter with you? So he said, well, go and do something. So he did, he really did. He, he got himself, he fearlessly got himself a, a broom and uh, rolled up a piece of newspaper and went in there and beat the bat to death. Aww. Right, I'm afraid so. But anyway, my, my view of the ANC's armed struggle took something of a hit from that moment. Okay. Uh, those of you who've seen a film called The Great Dictator will know why. It's a film in which a fearless Adolf Hitler is in this great big uh, uh, study and uh, a little mouse comes in and Adolf Hitler goes, climbs up the curtains to get away from the mouse. It was somewhat reminiscent of that. I'm not comparing Ronnie to Adolf Hitler at all. He's a much, much different man, and actually a really rather lovely man. But uh, there are, it did make me think a little bit about um, struggle. 
in South Africa. Now, what I'm going to be looking at is uh, the relationship that Kurt uh, was speaking about earlier, which is the relationship of the so-called radical flank in South Africa, or the armed struggle, the violent flank, to the mass democratic movement that developed in the country, and how they interacted with each other, and to what effect. Um, did it help? Did it hinder? And if it helped, what did it help? And if it hindered, what did it hinder? And that's what I'm going to try and deal with now. In any struggle, of course, one is always trying to find out what is the best method to use to achieve the optimal outcome at the least cost to yourselves. And that's what we were seeking to do. That was the, the, the question that motivated us throughout the struggle. And in the South African case for many decades, from the early um, 20th century, the, the early 1900s, through until 1960, that question had been answered firmly with nonviolent mobilization. Those of you who, uh, there may be some of you who don't know that Mohandas Gandhi, the leader of the uh, independence uh, struggle in India and uh, the man that we've heard so much reference to so far as the inspiration for much of the, uh, the, the strategic doctrine of nonviolent uh, resistance, Gandhi actually started his career in South Africa in the early 1900s and left a very influential legacy behind him. Uh, which the ANC, which was formed in 1912, adopted. And the ANC uh, was heavily uh, involved with the Indian Congresses or movements that had actually been established by Gandhi to try and improve Indian rights, uh, Indian minority rights in, in uh, those parts of South Africa where indentured Indian laborers had been brought to work on sugar, sugar cane plantations. And this, the ANC gradually uh, worked with, rather, this uh, tradition of nonviolent resistance for many, many years. And over, particularly after World War II, um, it uh, stepped up its use of nonviolent resistance quite dramatically. Um, the uh, uh, war had led to various social changes in South Africa, among them the development of a, a black industrial working class, apart from just a, a mining working class and an agricultural working class. And there were various social changes that had occurred. But at the same time, the ANC, this venerable old movement that had been a sort of a group of old chiefs and intellectuals petitioning in the past, was transformed in the period after World War II into a mass movement by people like Mandela. There was another man called Walter Sisulu, Oliver Tambo, who was another lawyer like Mandela and was in legal practice with him for a while, a man called Governor Becky. There, were, there was a group of sort of young Turks, gifted intellectuals, who set about turning the ANC into a mass movement. And by a mass movement, I'm, I'm, what I'm referring to here is a movement which was aggressively deploying nonviolent resistance uh, to promote um, uh, the attainment of rights for the black African majority in South Africa. And uh, they mounted various campaigns, perhaps the most uh, important of which was known as the Defiance Campaign, which is a campaign against, uh, uh, in defiance of unjust laws. Uh, all black South Africans had to, had to carry a sort of internal passport. All adult South Africans, at least adult black South Africans, had to carry an internal passport, which designated where in the country they were entitled to live or work. And was a, 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 was a system of both security and... Uh, and labor control that uh, was a source of great grievance to, to, to people. And one of the most important parts of the defiance campaign was an attempt to defy the requirement that all black people carry these, these passes, or what were called dom passes, which means stupid pass. Um, now, in the course of that defiance campaign, the ANC's mass following or mass uh, membership increased substantially. The ANC also involved itself in a a variety of other campaigns with allied organizations uh, from the um, various minority groups, the Indian minority, the mixed race or colored minority, and those, those small number of whites who uh, supported the democratic struggle. And these uh, organizations had all got together in 1955 to draw up a, a document called the, the Freedom Charter, which was a, a sort of a lodestar document, a kind of guiding star document, not a literal statement of of policy, but a sort of an aspirational document of the kind of society that South Africans wanted to see. And uh, the Freedom Charter was another uh, 
uh, part in, in the ANC's campaign to develop a, a mass movement. Now, as a, as a result of these various campaigns, uh, the ANC was, a, was subject to perpetual repression of various kinds, usually of an administrative kind, by which I mean uh, the issuing of house arrest or banning orders, etc., rather than people being put on trial. But they were, a, a group of leaders were put on trial uh, as a result particularly of the Freedom Charter campaign. They put on, it became known as the Treason Trial. It went on for about four years. And it was one of a number of attempts to tie the ANC leadership up in, in this instance legal procedure and keep them from mobilizing people. This tide of growing resistance and uh, uh, also led to the development of other uh, black nationalist organizations, particularly one called the Pan-Africanist Congress, uh, which came into existence partly also in response against the Freedom Charter, which had stated that South Africa belonged to all who lived in it, black and white, which uh, uh, was unacceptable, uh, quite understandably, uh, or, or, or doubtful, a doubtful proposition to many black African people. Anyway, at a, 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 a uh, demonstration mounted by the PAC, the Pan-Africanist Congress, in a place called Sharpville, about 60 miles south of Johannesburg, uh, unarmed demonstrators were fired upon by police, um, many of them in the back, and some 67 were shot dead, and many others were maimed. Uh, this resulted in a uh, storm of protest and political um, objections, and uh, the... In the emergency that followed, the government banned the ANC and the Pan-Africanist Congress and a number of other allied organizations, arrested their leaders, uh, tens of thousands were arrested, and uh, South Africa moved into an era of repression uh, which uh, exceeded anything that had been seen before. Now, in response to that repression in the post-1960, in 1960, uh, those ANC leaders who were still at liberty, and that was not all, and the ANC having been banned could not meet formally, but those ANC leaders at liberty, together with a number of communists who they had long had uh, links with, decided to adopt armed struggle, to go for armed struggle. And they um, organized over a period of about 18 months for uh, this armed struggle, in the process of which they took almost all well, in fact, all, I don't have to say almost, they took all the most gifted ANC organizers and took them out of political roles and put them into uh, this new military organization, which was to be called Umkunto Wisiswi, which is Zulu for Spear of the Nation. And uh, they announced uh, the, the formation of Umkunto Wisiswi with a series of bomb attacks on December the 16th, 1961, and a release of their manifesto, which started off... Um, the time comes in the life of every nation where there remain only two choices, to submit or fight. That time has now come to South Africa. Um, we, sorry, we will not submit and we have no choice but to fight. Now, that is a dichotomy, submit or fight. And certainly the form that the dichotomy was given was you either submitted or you took up arms struggling. And if you didn't take up arms, you weren't fighting. Uh, it was a false dichotomy. And like most false dichotomies, there were other possibilities that lurked in between those two choices, like you could go to the beach. You could forget about it. You could go and watch football and go to the races. And I'm afraid that is what we are looking at in South Africa. And I don't mean to be uh, disrespectful to those who took the decision, but uh, there is a false dichotomy here which bears being pointed out, which is what I've sought to do. Now, that initial um, resort to armed struggle was, as the, as the, uh, um, uh, the manifesto of Mkwinto Wisiswi uh, makes evident, the main claim in that initial resort was that they were embarking upon essentially a defensive struggle. But behind the notion of a defensive, we will protect ourselves, we will not submit, we will fight back, behind that defensive claim, there was uh, a, a very strong um, feeling and an overwhelming feeling that they were going to have to go very quickly onto the offensive and work towards mounting a sustained uh, guerrilla struggle inside South Africa. Now, at this point, there were accounts, some of them not quite yet published, but accounts coming out of uh, Cuba of what had happened in Cuba, 
uh, and the most influential of them turned out to be one written by Che Guevara. Now, I know that Che Guevara is somebody that many of us have had on our walls at, at home, but if you have, tear it down, burn it, stamp on it, and throw it away. Because the, the version of uh, Cuban history that he gave was nonsense. <laughs> and the, uh, the claims that he made on the basis of the nonsense were extremely damaging to the, the Marxist left or the left movement, the anti-colonial movement, and to many others uh, across the world in the subsequent decades. What uh, Guevara was essentially claiming was that armed struggle alone could, so to say, independent of any organization by political means of people, detonate all round mass insurrection and bring about social change. So in other words, armed struggle became, let us say, the sole detonator, independent of political organization by political means, the sole detonator of, uh, of uh, mass uprising uh, or of uh, the defeat of oppressive regimes around the world. It was a very tragic set of submissions, and at the time it was one, even more tragically, that many people believed, and the ANC among them. Uh, and the effect on the ANC was devastating. There were other uh, models uh, available that the ANC could have followed, among them a Maoist protracted people's war model, which would have involved a much more slow, gradual uh, development of the capacity for armed struggle, including the assiduous development of a political base by a political organization. But the ANC uh, rejected those other models in favor of this Guevara's model. Now, the key issue here for the ANC in the years to come and the key arguments, which I'm going to spend a little bit of time on as we go on, the key argument here became, well, now that we've decided on to go for armed struggle, what should the relationship be between political forms of struggle and military forms of, of struggle? And that, de that uh, debate took various forms over the next 20-odd, uh, 30 years without ever having been resolved except in the event but it was never resolved intellectually. Now, the, the key point in the organization that the ANC went in for of its armed struggle is, as I've indicated, its disregard of political organization of people by political means. And by political means, I mean going around talking to people, getting people to form organizations, convincing people to take particular forms of action or inviting them into a discussion, getting them to decide what forms of action they wish to engage upon, engage in. And it was this disregard for political struggle or political activity by political means that uh, I'm going to focus on now. By 1965, the ANC's armed struggle had been completely destroyed. The ANC itself had, in effect, been completely destroyed. In 1965, by the end of 1965, after the arrest of a, a white Communist Party leader called Brown Fisher in November, of 1965, you could literally count on one hand, the num one hand, and I exaggerate not, one hand, the number of people associated with the ANC or its allies who were then still politically active inside South Africa. Everybody who had been politically active was either now in exile on Robben Island or in Pretoria Central if they were white, those are two big prisons, or they were completely stumm and they decided to go to the beach, go to the races, go to the football. Um, and that created a huge vacuum inside South Africa. Now, abroad, the ANC decided that it should attempt to get back to the country and engage, and the way it decided to do so, to attempt to do so, was by armed struggle. And it became involved in uh, joint uh, armed campaigns with one of the Zimbabwean liberation movements of the time called ZAPU. And uh, it uh, in, was engaged in 1967 and 68 in two campaigns where it sought to infiltrate guerrillas from uh, 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 Zambia across the Zambezi River into what was then Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, and then on into South Africa. Um, there was no mobilization of local tribes done in the areas of Zimbabwe into which they were supposed to move. They didn't even know that there was no water in the escarpment across which they had to go for some several hundred miles in order to get to any kind of urban or population, substantial population centers. Um, the, what I'm pointing to point out here was the, the absence of a political approach and uh, 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 careful planning. 
as a, for rising out of these uh, failures, when the ANC met at an emergency conference or a crisis conference, not an emergency conference, a, a crisis conference in Tanzania in 1969 in a town called Morogoro, they paid lip service in various formulations to the notion of political struggle, but ended up asserting that, and I quote, the only, the only way forward, or way open to them was armed struggle. Now, notwithstanding these um, uh, attempts to get an armed struggle started and to sustain one inside South Africa, between 1965 and 1976, there was no armed struggle at all, at all, in South Africa. What you have instead is a huge political uh, vacuum and a state of extraordinary quiescence among a population which is still suffering, perhaps now worse than before, from the grievances which had led to the defiance campaign, the mass mobilization, and then uh, the adoption of armed struggle. And into this vacuum, however, in the late 1960s, march two groups of people, two groups of very gifted young intellectuals, one not black, one not mainly white. The black consciousness movement, which was the black body, obviously, uh, set out to, uh, in, a very in, in a very interesting um, uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, set of, uh, in a very interesting intellectual tradition, set out to, to assert that black people uh, would continue to be oppressed for as long as they continued to be, in a sense, complicit in their own oppression. What the black consciousness movement was saying was that black people had to themselves psychologically liberate themselves in order to be able to liberate themselves in the external world. They had to liberate themselves internally to, in order to be able to liberate themselves externally. Now, in this thinking, you will notice that there's something really very profound. And it, it's, uh, what I'm referring to is the connection between what the black consciousness movement was saying then and what those of us who uh, have read the classics on civil resistance now recognize as being a truth about the nature of power. What the black consciousness movement was saying was that power is not a top-down relationship, it's a bottom-up relationship. Those at the bottom are the people who have the power to decide who will, ru will rule them. Those at the top rule the people at the bottom to the extent that the people at the bottom allow them to rule them. Okay? And that is what the black consciousness movement was saying. Very profound insight, and it had uh, electrifying results on a whole generation of young black people, which we'll come to in a moment. The other group that, it, that moved into this vacuum in the late 1960s and early 1970s was a group of young white intellectuals, mainly independent Marxists, not related to the Communist Party, who were excluded now by the black consciousness movement from working with, both, with, with black radicals because the black consciousness movement was saying that black people had to uh, go through this, e this internal transformation alone. These young white uh, Marxists set about reorganizing the black working class into trade unions in South Africa. And their thinking was also very profound. Their thinking was that to the extent that the apartheid regime could guarantee uh, uh, economic prosperity for those who backed it, mainly the whites, it depended upon black labor to do it. An organization of black labor was therefore a strategic requirement of attempting to inflict damage upon the apartheid regime. Now, both these organizations were avowedly um, nonviolent in their approach and sought, as best they could, to remain within the law. Although, given the conditions in South Africa at the time, they inevitably became involved in an area of struggle which you could call the semi-legal, because they were never free of administrative repression, at least, by the regime. The, it is really the, the black consciousness movement which inspired the kind of spirit of resistance among a new young black generation, uh, which in, led in 1976 to that generation de de deciding in the biggest of the segregated black townships in South Africa called Soweto, that they would not be taught in a language called Afrikaans, which they identified as the language of the oppressor. It's a sort of a Dutch-derived language, uh, spoken mainly by part of the white population most identified with apartheid. And that refusal led police to open fire on several thousand school children marching through the streets of Soweto, 
Several hundred were shot, uh, many of them died, and South Africa and black townships um, <coughs> exploded across the country. This picture here, memorable picture, as you will have seen it, is the death of a young boy called Hector Peterson. He's 12 years old. He's lying in the arms of this chap. And uh, he was, he's recorded as being the first person to be shot dead in the Soweto uprising. Now, the Soweto uprising convulsed uh, the country. It convulsed the younger generation into deciding, as many of them did in the heat of the moment, um, that they wanted to go and get military training and come back and fight. It convulsed their, the older generation because they felt terribly guilty and shamed by the fact that the younger generation had been left to fight this uh, uh, battle that in many, in many respects many in the older generation felt they should have resolved before they, this young generation had come along. And uh, it, led, it had a variety of results. Uh, several thousand young blacks left the country to go and receive military training abroad. And uh, the, the, inside the country, it had a different effect. Uh, it stimulated a range of political organizations, which I'll come to in a moment. But I'll stay with the ANC and the military for the moment. The, this uh, surfeit of young people who left in the first uh, uh, exodus was about 4,000 people over the next year. Um, some of them started being sent back on military missions, or guerrilla missions, in the, uh, 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 late 19, uh, the late months of 1976 and the early months of 1977. But the armed struggle, as it proceeded uh, over the next uh, two years, was very sporadic. It was about one or two actions every month. Uh, most of them very modest, um, things like attacks on, on electricity pylons and things like that. And the armed struggle remained at a very low level of intensity, not because the ANC wished it so. The ANC wished it to be a great deal different and, and a great deal more effective and more um, broadly spread. Okay. Um, but uh, the... The, uh, the, the ANC was, was having great difficulty in actually embedding any kind of armed presence or command structure, in particular inside the country. And its frustrations at this point led it to, a point, to set up a thing called the Political Military Strategy Commission, uh, which led and, and discussed uh, the problems. And uh, it, this dissolved into a number of very serious disputes and arguments between those who wanted to continue with the military does all approach uh, that had been the case since 1961, to those who were saying, no, we actually need a, a radically different approach which is politically led at every single level, including in the leadership of the armed struggle. This uh, commission couldn't reach any agreement, and they sought arbitration, so to say, from the Vietnamese, who uh, and by 1975 had uh, succeeded in defeating uh, the US-backed uh, government in South Vietnam. And the Vietnamese had, of course, conducted perhaps the most broad-based and resolute armed struggle ever seen in the kind of modern revolutionary, uh, in the sort of modern revolutionary period. Uh, the Vietnamese took uh, a briefing from them and uh, took a day or two to come back with a response and came back and told the ANC, military leader, the ANC leadership, rather, led at that stage by Oliver Tambo, who was president of the ANC, you guys have got it all wrong. You should be engaging in political organization by political means. It's doubtful that you should even be involved in an armed struggle. You might return to an armed struggle later, but your task for now is to organize people politically by whatever means you possibly can, exploiting all possible opportunities for contact with your people. It's politics, stupid. It's the politics, stupid. Okay. Now, this came as quite a shock to the ANC, um, and uh, it came as a great shock to many of those involved in the military leadership. Um, but it didn't resolve the problem. It didn't resolve the argument. And there was, over succeeding years, and if anybody, anybody of you want to read a really boring story, you can read my, my doctoral thesis, which is the story of these endless arguments that took place. Plus a change. The more things changed in the ANC, the more they stayed the same. Uh, these, these arguments went on and on and on. But the important thing was that inside the country, as a result of the Soweto uprising, those who had not gone abroad had started organizing politically by political means inside the country. Hundreds, thousands of organizations, women's groups, 
workers, trade unions, student groups, civic organizations, boycott committees, release Mandela committees, release political prisoners committees had started up around the townships. And uh, uh, the, uh, they didn't depend upon or wait for anybody to be given permission to organize. They organized. They needed to organize. There were urgent problems in the community that needed to be addressed. And in order to do so, they needed to organize politically. And so they did. But out of these, if we go now to the exile ANC leadership again, out of these many disagreements, there arose uh, a new political leadership of the ANC abroad, which came under the uh, leadership of this man, a very clever man called Mac Maharaj. Uh, and uh, Maharaj um, started to, from exile to work, to establish contacts with some of these people who are now developing these organizations inside the country, and developed quite a, a fruitful relationship with them. Maharaj had sufficient wisdom to recognize that uh, the ANC could not lead tactically from abroad. Instead, the ANC had, so to say, to lead from behind, like the Duke of Plazatora. If you know about the Duke of Plazatora, he led his troops from behind. Okay? Anyway, the ANC had, so to say, to lead from behind, uh, which was a, a realistic and, and sophisticated response from Maharaj, a very clever man. And out of these, uh, these, uh, uh, these, these various organizations, there came uh, a potential for more serious political organization. And in 1981, there came also an opportunity of a campaign or an issue around which they could um, uh, mobilize. And that was the 20th anniversary of the White Sony Republic. And a campaign against that, 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 uh, that celebration of the White Sony Republic or the White Dominated Republic in South Africa formed a national focus of these many grievances. And for the first time now, really, since the 1960s, the ANC's, uh, uh, not the ANC, the, 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 the mass of people inside South Africa, all their, their many different grievances, found that their, uh, their many local uh, grievances could be and should be focused upon uh, a resolution at the central state level. And this campaign against the uh, white-dominated republic really was the first time that there had developed in South Africa since 1960 a mass-based uh, struggle or campaign which focused on the issue of state power. It was a big breakthrough. And out of that breakthrough over the next uh, two years came the constituent parts for the formation of the United Democratic Front, which Harvey spoke about and I was speaking about in the previous session. And this was, of course, a major uh, uh, direction uh, on the issue of state power as the means by which to address these very many different struggles and, and problems. The United Democratic Front resulted in the most extraordinary ferment. Uh, mass rallies, particular pension, at least not, uh, petition campaigns, anti-rent uh, campaigns, boycotts of uh, uh, payment of rents in, uh, to the government, boycotts of the payment of service uh, charges to the government. Um, huge uh, ferment across the country and South Africa from about 1984 moved into a, a, an unending perpetual state of insurrection in one or other part of the country. It was sort of a rolling insurrection. Uh, the ANC's armed struggle rose marginally in intensity, but when I say marginally, I mean marginally. If you look at the figures for uh, the insurgency in Iraq against US-backed forces at the height of the insurgency, and you look at how many, acts, how, many acts, uh, how many attacks there were in one day by insurgents in Iraq uh, against uh, US-backed forces, uh, you'll get some idea of the weakness of the ANC's armed struggle because the figures will show you that in one day, Iraqi insurgents mounted more attacks on US-backed forces than the ANC managed against the South African government in 30 years. Okay. Well, I'll repeat that. If you look at the figures, you will see that in one day, Iraqi insurgents at the height of their insurgency against uh, um, US-backed forces uh, were responsible for more attacks on those US-backed forces in one day than the ANC managed in, in terms of attacks on the South African regime government in 30 years. Okay, I think that tells a story. Um, now, 
So what I'm saying is that even in this massive ferment, the armed struggle became, uh, was, was, was of marginal importance. Um, the successive states of emergency that the regime uh, implemented were, uh, failed to destroy the, uh, the uh, UDF. And when in 1988 the, United, the, the government eventually in effect banned the UDF, the UDF and the major trade unions formed an even more powerful organization called the uh, Mass Democratic Movement, not the UDM, the MDM, the mass, uh, mass, the mass Democratic Movement. What happened over this period of mass ferment was that the uh, important elements in the white power structure, notably white businessmen, the legal white opposition, and others sought talks with the ANC. That it was, became quite clear that the uh, South African government no longer commanded their, uh, their um, confidence as a body which could come up with rational options which could secure their interests. They had to look elsewhere and they were prepared to start looking at the ANC. These talks that developed between the, uh, um, the white, government, white business leaders and the ANC and others Led the, created a legal situation in which the ANC could now seek talks with its natural allies inside the country. So the ANC began coalition building now with those organizations, constituent parts of the MDM, the UDF, and the MDM and UDF itself uh, about uh, um, forming uh, an alliance, which was in, in, in effect almost a fact by that stage anyway, but formalizing the tactical and strategic perspectives that they that they, that they wished, that they shared or needed to share. Now at this time as well, they developed amongst uh, intelligence uh, officials in the uh, South African government at that time, the view that they could no longer hold the war, that actually it was no longer possible for the government to reform in a way that would be in some sense demobilizing of the opposition. It had to find a way uh, to reform and actually seriously accommodate the opposition. There was no way out of now uh, uh, a, uh, a very, very fundamental uh, set of, of, uh, of compromises. And in fact, there's a, there's a very interesting uh, memoir that's coming out in the next three or four months by the former chief of operations of the old government security Intelli intelligence service, a man called Maritz Barwater. It's coming out in, I think, November. Uh, it should be quite interesting because he was one of the intelligence officials who actually then set up um, um, uh, contacts with the ANC, which led to talks. Um, the ANC leaders themselves, yeah, okay, the ANC leaders themselves um, uh, found that they had to re recalculate their options as well, very f fundamentally, because the Soviet Union had collapsed. The ANC, it was no longer possible for the ANC to get arms from the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was redrawing its, its uh, strategic outlook. And Exchanges of signals between the ANC and the South African government became talks about talks, then eventually became talks and uh, negotiations. And as we know, the ANC was then unbanned in 1990, and the rest is history. Now my final slide. What are the paradoxes? What are the, what are the points of all this? Well, first of all, it's that it's the politics, stupid. Okay? It's the politics that matter. What comes out of this history for me as it, re as it relates to Kurtz uh, and, and, and Erica's uh, findings is that the ANC's obsession with armed struggle from 1960s to 1979 undermined its ability to mount not only civil resistance, which it obviously did because it withdrew all its, its best people from the civil resistance, but it also subverted the ANC's ability even to mount a successful armed struggle because they didn't create any kind of political base on which to, on which to mount it. Secondly, civil resistance in South Africa displaced and supplanted an armed struggle of which powerful political forces intended that civil resistance should be a mere tributary. Civil resistance was supposed to help armed struggle. It didn't. Civil resistance supplanted armed struggle as the main form of struggle. Third, there was a sort of an iconography of violence uh, in, in uh, uh, South Africa. Uh, I showed you, oops, um, uh, let me just take you to this picker, picture. As you can see, uh, this guy's a man, so you'll understand what I say when he pre clearly appreciates that size matters, okay, <laughs> with this, uh, with this uh, AK-47. Um, but this iconography of violence that, that occurred at ANC meetings, there was an iconography of violence. There would be people dressing up in play-play, MK uni uniforms, etc. At a particular point in the liberation struggle, it did help advance the, uh, the, uh, um, uh, the struggle being waged by nonviolent means by 
making people understand as by helping people to believe that there was no difference in the validity of armed struggle or civil resistance. It's difficult to know quite how to interpret it, but that's the interpretation that I give it. And I was at some of those meetings where we saw those uh, sorts of uh, icons, and that is the way I interpreted them. The, the statement that was coming across, what was being said, not necessarily with any conscious intent, but the message that was obtruding through the psychonography was, doesn't matter whether you're armed or unarmed, unarmed struggle or civil resistance is as valid a form of struggle as armed struggle. This is a popular message, not the ANC talking. This is people. And finally, it's possible for an organization that has exhibited at some point an unrivaled will to struggle against an unjust opponent, such as the ANC did, eventually to win power on the back of energies, organizations, and forms of resistance developed by others and in which it had had only a tangential role in generating. Thank you. So.